Well, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, had a wonderful time Thursday night, and uh, today we're going to deal with something uh, that I touched on just extreme, very briefly at one point, and yet it's such an important uh, particular site of the Bible and some of the important things that were done. And that's the place called Ephesus. Has anybody been to Ephesus in here? Not hard anybody. Well, I take tours to Turkey every year, and we always go to Ephesus, including all the seven churches and Patmos, where D John wrote the Revelation, and other places like that. I love Turkey. It's a great place, uh, nice most of the year, unlike Israel, which gets warm. Uh, Turkey doesn't so much get that way. So anyway, um, I'm going to go through uh, the letter to the Ephesians, but I'm not going to read through Ephesians. It would take the whole time to just read the book. And really what I'm wanting to do is point out archaeological things that relate to the book. So what we're going to do is uh, go through here and uh, look at some of the fe features that we find in the book of Ephesus, or excuse, Ephesians that we know from archaeology in Ephesus. And so I have written out here importance of Ephesians and also Ephesus, obviously. Paul preached the gospel and wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus. Now we know that. Uh, that obviously Paul wrote a letter to the Ephesians. It's one of the more important books in the Pauline epistles. It has some of the grandest statements. And uh, in the book to the uh, Ephesian church, he was able to uh, set forth a lot of principles that we understand now regarding the relationship of Jew and Gentile, questions of predestination, matters relating to the spiritual warfare, and on and on, all of which could take a series, but we're not going to do that. So what we're going to do is talk about a little bit here to the introduction, and uh, we'll get into that in, in just a moment. Uh, secondly, we're going to see that the Apostle John lived in Ephesus. Now of all places, why go there? Remember, John was in Israel. And Jesus on the cross said something very interesting to John. He calls him, you know, the, the, the writer John uh, mentions that uh, he's the, he, he sort of doesn't say this is me, but it becomes obvious he's talking about himself, the one whom Jesus loved. That's found so many places where John is involved and uh, even to the Last Supper and other times. But what you find is in, in, in John 19, you locate a, a verse of Scripture where Jesus speaks down to his mother. He says something to her. And then he says to the one whom he loved among the disciples, which doesn't mean he didn't love the others. But John, we may not realize, John was more like a teenager at this point, whereas Peter like was an older man in comparison. So we don't really get these ages of the apostles, but it becomes pretty plain that John was the, it was the young guy in the group. And so he lived until the 90s, whereas all the apostles by that time were, were dead, except for him. And of course, he wrote the last, you know, he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he wrote the Revelation, he wrote the Gospel of John. All these are occurring in the 80s and 90s, probably, uh, of the first century. So he moved uh, to Ephesus, but the text goes on in, in John 19. And he looks at John and he says, behold your mother. So what he did, he sort of said, you know, you're in charge of my mother. Now that's important in that day and time because uh, uh, remember Mary was probably a teenager uh, when uh, she had Jesus. And uh, she would have been a, you know, a more mature person at this point. We're talking about more than 30 years later. So I don't know. She's probably close to 50 and, and how would she support herself? Who would take care of her? There's a lot of issues to be dealt with here. But um, he tells John to take care of her, and he moves her to Ephesus. And I'll show you something in a minute. It's traditional. We don't have a biblical passage that specifies it. But it's a long tradition, and it may very well be true, because she would have been with him at Ephesus, and what, where would she have been? We'll talk about that. Um, so we find that John lived there, and there is a church at Ephesus that received a letter from John. Anybody know what that is? 
Well, you have, you have several letters to seven different churches in the book of Revelation. The first one is to Ephesus. That's where he lived. So he wrote a church to the home folks, <laughs> and then a letter to each of the other group, and it came out in the Revelation we call John, uh, the book of Revelation, where he, he, after he finishes the second and third chapter, he moves into the discussion of end times. Chapter 1 is talking about, in the book of Revelation that John wrote, chapter 1 is talking about his uh, connection to the angel that spoke to him. Uh, Jesus spoke through the angel to him and gave some basic revelation. Chapters 2 and 3 with the seven churches, 4 to the end, talks about the end of the world. So that's what John wrote. And, but he wrote that not from Ephesus, which is where he lived and worked, but he was uh, marooned, if you want to use that, or he was at least uh, exiled to the Isle of Patmos, which I'll show you a map in just a moment. You can get a feel for how far that is. But eventually he did come back to Ephesus, apparently. So that's important because we do have a traditional grave for John in Ephesus, and we'll talk about that. Um, thirdly, Luke uses the Greek word asiarchs for leaders in Ephesus. That's another important thing we find archaeologically that confirms something that's said in the, the book that, uh, that Luke wrote. And in Luke's uh, letter, his, the second, you know, he did the gospel and then he did the, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, he has a reference in chapter 19, I believe it is, where you had a person called an Asiarch who was a uh, leader of the community. He was an official in the community. And scholars for many years, as I talked about the other night, remember I, um, for those of you who were here on uh, uh, Thursday night, you had people in, this, in the 19th century who were arguing because higher criticism and regarding the Bible had just sort of flourished out of the Enlightenment period. And so now you have biblical scholars questioning the text, whether it's accurate and all this. And they were saying, well, Luke was not a very good historian because all these things and these terms he uses and these places he mentions, he didn't know what he was doing. Of course, these guys are scholars and obviously they know everything. So Nonetheless, um, we, we have, though, a man by the name of Sir William Ramsey who was an unbeliever, but he had a Christian friend who traveled with him, who kept witnessing to him and kept pointing out, you know, Luke mentions this, Luke mentions this. And so they found these monuments that Luke actually re used terms and references and things that scholars didn't know about because they hadn't done the archaeology. They hadn't traveled. They just sat back in their seat back at Oxford or someplace and, and wrote books. So the fact is uh, they found all these kinds of examples. They found Asiarch. They found Polytarch. And the Asiarch is also here at the uh, place of Ephesus. And so once again Luke is correct in what he had to say. I always find that interesting. I, I, sometimes when I do tours and I do videos, I will say something like, once again, archaeology catches up with the Bible. <laughs> because the Bible was correct the whole time. It's just that you had to do the work of the archaeology instead of just write books about it. Go see what you can find. This happened with the whole place of Hattusha, the Hittite kingdom. Phenomenal thing I'm not going to talk about now. But essentially, it was a major, major nation like Egypt. And scholars said it didn't exist, even though it was mentioned 48 times. The Hittites mentioned 48 times in the Bible, it didn't exist because they hadn't found it, they said. Well, go look. And they finally looked at the end of the 19th century. Uh, they found a magnificent kingdom up in the north. I've been there during the winter, it was great. Snow on the ground, cool air. I looked at this and I said, I know why they moved here. This is beautiful. And so there's some fascinating things at Hattusha. But um, it had a major impact on the writing of the Exodus you don't know about right now. Uh, we'll maybe get to that sometime and talk about how the influence uh, that Moses, as a one who was trained in the courts of Pharaoh, learn Hittite material. And I'll, we can talk about that later and how that comes into the Bible. But uh, so Luke has this Asiarch in Matthew uh, in uh, Acts 19 and we found it there. Okay. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, as I've said, lived with John, according to tradition, 
she lived with him at Ephesus. And there is a house that we're going to look at that's said to be the house of Mary. Now, is it the house of Mary? I don't know. But I do know this. Tradition tends to be in the ancient world more reliable than what we do. They relied so much on tradition. It connected their communities. It connected the generations. And they passed down things constantly. That's why you have in the Hebrew Bible, if you are English too, if you'll go to uh, the uh, Genesis account, you'll see a thing called the family histories or the genealogies of. Uh, the, the term toledot is a Hebrew term, and it means the, the histories of the family. And they kept record of everything from generation to generation to generation. And these have been proved to be very liable. So I'm saying they are concerned about passing on tradition. Remember when, when Joshua came across the River Jordan and they put up 12 stones and they say, now when your children ask about this, when they're not using their cell phone, you know, when they ask about this, you can tell them about those 12 stones and the story of crossing the Jordan and, and God giving us the land of Canaan. In other words, you can pass down that information. See, it was important to them, more so than us. We have everything we can just keep in print and on the computer, and we don't have to remember anything, see. There are cultures, because of the need of memory, because they don't have a lot of stuff like we have, they actually rehearse and dictate generation to generation their cultures that know all the stories word for word. Uh, and I, you know... I'm not trying to put anybody down here, but a lot of fairly illiterate Muslims can recite to you the Koran, whereas most of us probably can't cite the Bible. I can't. <laughs> You'd have to take some time, but if you hear it again and again and again, and that's how you work with it, then you begin to pick up. Your, your brain cells tend to work better when you work them instead of letting them sleep. And so... Uh, I, find, I think about that getting older now, and I try to remember everything. And if I can't remember something, I sit there and I just think and think and think until I get it, because I don't let anything get past my mind that I can't remember. So uh, that's, that's a good thing to do. Uh, Timothy was a worker with Paul. Remember, Timothy came from a mixed family. Uh, Timothy was raised from a Gentile, a Greek and a mother who was a Jew. But it says because of the, the mother and her mother that from a child he had known the Holy Scriptures wise, making him wise unto salvation. And that's when Paul said all Scriptures God breathed. Uh, apparently dad didn't care. <laughs> and the mother and grandmother worked on Timothy and look what he became. He became probably the major worker of Paul. Uh, his son, Timothy, he called him that. So fascinating, uh, Timothy with Paul. Paul. Timothy was the pastor, after a while, Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus, which becomes an important thing. So uh, we have two letters to Timothy and certainly much other letters. Last of all, it was at Ephesus in the second century where they had a council, the third ecumenical council. Uh, I'm not asking you to tell me any of the others, but you probably have heard of Nicaea. And then there is a council of, uh, at the church of Irina. Okay, that's my wife's name, Irina. We went there to visit. She was so excited to see this church that was named after her. And, and so the word arena means peace in, in, uh, in Greek and other languages. And so the church, of basically arena, that occurred at 381. See, Nicaea occurred at 325, dealt with the Trinity. 381 reconfirmed the doctrine of the Trinity. 431 became a very important uh, council, but it met at Ephesus in the church of St. Mary named after Mary, probably who lived there earlier, and certainly the Mary, the mother of Jesus. So that gives you some of the importance of Ephesians, the book and the place, Ephesus. Major, major site. Now, 
Uh, it has a theater, and I'll be showing that theater to you in a few minutes. I've got this thing organized a certain way because I'm going to take you on a trip through the, through the city of Ephesus. And I don't know how well I'll do it. It would be better if I had a video of it and just had it done <laughs> and show it to you. But I'm going to try to do it by, by photos for you'll be able to get a feel for being in Ephesus. Uh, one of the greatest cities of the archaeological world. And it has, has, has more universities and groups that have probably done excavation at Ephesus than any other place. They have even have ongoing excavations there now. Major universities uh, have uh, groups that come over and, and work there. And, and um, so as far as the seven churches, it's, there's not any rival to it. Now, it had a seat for about 25,000 people, which is pretty good size for a theater in the ancient world, and built into the middle of the city at a place called Mount Chorasus. Now, one thing you'll have to know, and if, have you been to Israel? Anybody have been to Israel? Okay. Uh, but if you go to Israel, I've only been there 43 times. But besides that, um, I've lived there a little bit too, so I've spent a lot of time looking at Israel. If you'll notice Israel, a place called Bet Shean, does that ring a bell with you? It's also called Scythopolis, after the Scythians, which are a group of people I'm not going to discuss from the north. But it became a Greek city. It's the only city of the Decapolis, which means ten cities, Deca, Polis, ten cities. The only city of the Decapolis mentioned in the Bible that's on the the uh, west side of the Jordan. All the others are a couple up in Assyria, a number in Jordan, and other places, but the only one in Israel. Very important, Bet Shean, that's a place that Saul and his sons were hung on the walls of the ancient city. But of course, the new city came with the Hellenistic move into the country. Uh, Alexander the Great, uh, he started his uh, move into uh, the world with a few thousand soldiers, a great strategy, and a lot of uh, chutzpah for a Greek, uh, they went and conquered the world. It's amazing. They even defeated people that you would think that you could not be defeated because of the numbers. Uh, strategy has a lot to do with it. And so without going to all the history, it's very interesting to read all of these things. But if you read Alexander, he came into Israel about 316 uh, B.C., and began to Hellenize the area, and Israel even, even Israel, began to be Hellenistic. Jewish boys were trying to hide their circumcision. Uh, they were involved in the, in the various uh, races and games and started wearing Greek clothes and Greek hairdos and Greek this and Greek that. They were becoming Greekized <laughs> or Hellenized. Hellas means Greek. And so uh, you find something, and I'm going to show you something in a minute that's going to surprise you. If you've been to Israel, you probably didn't know it when you saw it. But we'll talk about it. I got all this up here. I'm just waiting my way through. Now, so you have uh, the difference between a Greek theater and a Roman theater is very quickly seen. The Greeks built their theaters into mountainsides with an oval so that you'll always see this oval, but it's built into a mountainside. Roman theaters were built on stilts. The Romans were really big at you know, architecture and building, and they came up with the idea of, of having an arch that could support the weight. I mean, they were, they were geniuses, building roads throughout the world that still existed for hundreds, if not thousands. You can even walk on them today. The Romans were ma uh, really, really, very, really, very good at this. And, but the Romans, they didn't build into the mountainside. They built on, on a structure underneath to support it. So it's a different way of doing it. You can look immediately and say Greek or Roman. Okay? So uh, this theater at Ephesus, which I'm going to show you a little bit later, was able to handle a large crowd. Constructed around 133 B.C., it was modified and expanded in the first century. So the fact is, uh, this theater is going to have an importance in what we see in chapter 19 of Acts. Now, I'm not going to read all of this to you. You've got a Bible. You can read this later. But uh, this is a statement of Ephesus. This is where you see something. What? Revelation 2, 1 through 7. You find the issue that uh, Ephesus had a few problems. 
the writer of, um, of the book here, John, uh, teaches them what they need to do and go back to their first love and some things that need to happen. I'm not going to take time to try to work through that and tell you who the Nicolaitans are because I don't know myself. But uh, we do know something about them, but it's hard to identify them. There's a man in the 4th century who actually did a book on heresies, and he talks about them some, from his perspective at least. What I want to do now is show you something about maps. If you'll look here, I'll make sure I can get this to work. Uh -huh, can you see that? Oh, there it is. Uh, what we have here are provinces in Roman. I want to point out a couple things. Here's Cappadocia. I thought I mentioned that to you last time. This is an area that has underground cities. Very fascinating to visit, to go in the ground and see where Christians hid from both Romans and later on from Muslims <laughs> when they were invading. And so uh, Cappadocia, they have uh, these uh, little houses, sort of like gnome houses. You can go in, and yet you go into these churches that are no bigger than, oh uh, my goodness, uh, not, about half the size of the area out here. And they built uh, churches in there and had frescoes, beautiful frescoes painted on the walls. they just phenomenal stuff. And uh, a lot of other kinds of features. People lived in some of these kind of places. And... Um, that's in Cappadocia. A lot of things occurred there. Galatia, uh, again, is the area that uh, we have uh, to the left. And if you'll notice that it's an area, there's two portions to Galatians. The book of Galatians was written either to the northern portion of Galatia or to the southern. The northern was a Roman province. The southern was geographical. And there's a debate on which one is which. Uh, you have places like Cilicia, I'm going to show you something in a minute. You have uh, Pamphylia, Lycia. These are all monuments, by the way, I'll show you from Ephesus, mentioning these groups. But here's Bithynia. I want to mention something about Bithynia, and there you have Pontus. But uh, Bithynia is the area that Paul had planned on going into when God said, i got other plans. Isn't that amazing? You with an apostle? He's got, his, he's got his life planned out. He knows what he's going to do. And God says, no, that way. <laughs> and so God sends him across the strait right over into places we think of like Macedonia. And this becomes important later on. But uh, that is, uh, this is where you Hello? Hello? I don't know. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, yes, we're going across Constantinople, which is today called Istanbul. But the name Constantinople had something to do with a guy called Constantine, who apparently means a city of Constantine. And he lived there. <laughs> and when you're the emperor, you can name it what you want. So here he is. Uh, by the way, I found uh, Constantinople or, or uh, Istanbul to be an interesting city, but I never stay there too long because I get a little bit tired of, of some, some aspects of things that are going on there. But uh, nonetheless, Paul was in, uh, asked to go across the Straits and then go to uh, uh, up into Macedonia. As a matter of fact, I think he took a ship. And then you have Asia. And that's where you have what we think of as where the various churches are, largely. So uh, this is sort of how you lay out the Roman province. To give you another angle, again, here are the major churches. Uh, this right here is Laodicea. Remember Thursday night, I talked about two other cities that were important around Laodicea. One was called Hierapolis, Holy City. Now these weren't Christians at this time, but... They named it that. And then Colossae, very important city, which now will be excavated it's beginning. They've been doing all this, setting up the stages for getting ready for it. They're going to start excavation there in 2024, which I'm excited to have happen because every time I go there, I, I say, I wish somebody would excavate this, and finally I made it happen. So, um, you know, a little word. So the fact is they're going to do that in 2024, and uh, that will be another site that we have a chance to go see uh, that will be interesting. Uh, right now, you can see the rushing cold waters right on the ground near where you stand. 
it's interesting to see this, and they come from some really cold streams up, uh, up a, uh, a little ways away. I drove a car back into them. And so uh, that's, that's occurring there, plus a place called Laodicea. Laodicea, uh, Hierapolis, and Colossae, cities in the area of the Lycus Valley. So that's this area here. If I can get this back here again. There we are. And then you have other cities like Philadelphia. Philadelphia and Theatira, there's not much there. Basically a, a column. <laughs> That's about it. They haven't really got. Now, if they ever did excavations there, it might be something to talk about. But at this point, nobody has. But then the rest of the churches are pretty well developed, particularly this one right here, which is called Ephesus. And that's what we're discussing today. If you look at Ephesus here, we're going to go down right to here and look at a place called Patmos. And that's where John, who was in Ephesus right here, when he was uh, exiled by the emperor at that time, who would have been the emperor Domitian, he had him uh, sent into exile from this place in Ephesus right down here to Patmos in the middle of the ocean. It's a gorgeous area. I, I've got some wonderful videos of this blue, blue water. It's just gorgeous uh, on the way down there. And this is what is known as the Aegean Sea. You have a, uh, you have a uh, Atlantic Ocean, and it sort of runs into the uh, area of what is called the Mediterranean Sea, which also has a breaking into what is called the Aegean Sea. And see, so the Aegean Sea has all these various islands. The Greeks have 10,000 islands in the uh, Aegean Sea. Some are big, some are very little, uh, none of which belong to Turkey <laughs> that I know of. So that I think in the, in the final division of, of property, they sort of settled that. But uh, there you have Patmos, and it's a great place to, to go visit, really is. I could, a lot of people go there and live for a few weeks or months, just there to have a really nice island to be on. It's a gorgeous place. Anyway, now an aerial look at Ephesus. I thought I'd start out. Now we're going to start our journey, get ready to put on your walking shoes, and we're going to walk our way through Ephesus. And if you'll notice what you do, you don't have to fly right now. But what I want to show you is this right here. If I can turn over and sort of do it here. You see these right here? These are columns on either side of this walkway. And this is actually the entrance into what we call Ephesus. And it's fairly lengthy. And what you have there is uh, in the road, and you see this in all the basic Greek cities, you have these places built that they actually put up uh, uh, fire and usually some covers uh, for certain times of the year. It's sort of interesting to see what they did. And you don't see that today. It's all you know gone, but you have evidence of it. But people walk through here to get into Ephesus. They kept on walking and walking, and then they could turn this way. Now, obviously, you could come from another direction over here, too. But this is the main thoroughfare because this is the what was known as the Civic Agora. Now, the word Agora generally speaks for what we call marketplace, where business was done. And the civic business of Ephesus, and all the cities had these, had a, usually what is called a commercial Agora, and a civic agora. The civic agora is where you had the city hall and other things like that, governmental practices and actions and so forth. Uh, and then you had the commercial, which included the places to go shop, like a big, a really big shopping center, except it was outdoors. And um, so nonetheless, that's sort of what you're looking at here. This is sort of the civic agora. You're going to find the, the commercial agora right up here where my... To the right of this building here, this is the area of the commercial agora. You can't see yet where the theater is, but that gives you a feel for where we are. So we're walking in here, we're going in here, and then we're going to start down the pathway to this building right here. Okay? We'll look at a couple things along the way. Now, what we've done is that we've been walking down this street together. <laughs> coming into the city, and now you're in the city. You're going to go through, and I'll show you in a few minutes, the Pillars of Hercules. By the way, I had a chance to meet Hercules at Caesarea Philippi last year. 
Uh, you ever heard of a guy who was played Hercules on television? He also has been doing some recent movies. And uh, I, I used to watch him all the time, and I had a chance to visit with him because I, I knew the producer that does his stuff, and he was going to pass me by because he had another guy that probably took 10 minutes with him trying to get him to audio, do an audio tape. And finally he got away from him, and he was trying to get over to see John Lennox over by the Caesarea Philippi. And he was moving right past me, and I said, hey, do you know so-and-so? And he said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> and now we had time to talk. So that was sort of interesting to see someone I used to watch on television a lot. But uh, that was the fact of the, uh, they have the Pillars of Hercules here. And they, you're going to move on through here. And we're going we're gonna to look over here at something that was not there when Paul was there, but it's important for us to understand. Uh, this over here, a lot of houses, they have reconstructions going on. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to take you right up the mountain here to see something that was just discovered fairly recently. And unless you have special permission, which I have inside in uh, connections on this, very few people get to see this. But I always take my groups there because I talk to somebody I know and I get it there. It's the way it works. So uh, we're going to move up this way then because once we get coming into the city and we move past this building here, we're going to walk up this way and there'll be certain things to see along this pathway. By the way, if you, get, if you need it, this is where the restrooms are. I told somebody I wasn't sure if I was going to show this or not. It's interesting, but it might not be church time. I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. But it's sort of fascinating. what They, they have actually an orchestra that played in there. Now, um, you come up here to the big theater, which is where Paul and others were finally left at the, in, at the uh, encouragement of the Asiarch that I mentioned and got them out of there. And there was a big riot that took place. Can you imagine 24, 25,000 people yelling out for two solid hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You'll say it again. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two hours? I would have gone by then. I mean, I would have been out of there. Why wouldn't you want to stay there and say that for two hours? But anyway, two hours. And then this right here goes on down to the harbor where you got on a ship. And we'll talk about that because there is no harbor anymore. So, does that give you an introduction here? Now, we get a little bit better view. This is the place I just showed you with the theater. And here, right here, by this building that I'm pointing out here, this right here was the commercial agora. And we'll show you some shops up and down the way in these areas. But if you were going to the theater, you would walk into here, and you actually would come up into this area and sit up here. I think I mentioned Thursday night. I really don't understand it. You know, you know I've been in coliseums before. I've been into, you know, uh, places for football games and things like that. And I feel fairly safe walking. I do not feel safe walking these stairs very much. They're solid stone. All you got to do is fall once and you break everything probably. I don't know how they ever survived. I really don't, particularly when you get a riot. So I don't know what the answer of that is. I just know that I wouldn't want to do it. Now, um, this is built, as you can see, into a hill. Can you see that? That's how the Greeks did it. Uh, that's how I found the first thing at Laodicea one day. I thought, there's nothing here. And I saw something oval, and I thought, let me go check that out. And as I kicked around in the grass, I found stones. I said, aha, there used to be a theater here. Now it's all excavated, so it's all nice. But uh, you can see those things. Now, another picture of it that's looking down on the theater. You can see the mountain in the background. By the way, if you were to just go from that distance over that mountain to the next, you would see another portion of what would be Ephesus. And it was a, some of, a, of a, a fortress, but you also have up there now the what is called the Church of St. John, and they have his burial place there, uh, at least in their tradition. Whether it is or not, I don't know. But uh, nonetheless, he had to be buried somewhere, and he was at Ephesus, so that probably it could be the place. But you could go over there and go over here, but we're not going to do that today. Uh, but right down here, you'd walk again, and down here you go down to get in the ship. So we'll look at that. This is a broader view. This gives you a view of all of it. See, this is, gives you, it's a more, 
it's taking in more information. And so you can see right here that this is where the theater is. People would have come down and, uh, and worked in here. This is uh, the full broad uh, area of the buildings in the, in the ancient Ephesus. Now, the countryside. Let's talk about the countryside. You'll notice what kind of place it is. There are a lot of hills and valleys. That's one thing you'll notice when you're in Turkey, is that you have, like the Lacus Valley I mentioned, you've got a lot of these places that are built in the hills, but you have these massive, beautiful valleys that you walk through. I, could even, I can see Paul and Timothy and others you know, walking through these areas. They weren't having to climb over tall mountains. They had these beautiful valleys you could walk in as you went to the places you go. And uh, it's, a, it's really a, uh, a wonderful area. It just gives you a feel for the kinds of places that are around. We're not talking about uh, necessarily a, a gigantically high mountains, but they are all over the place, ins and out valleys going through them. So we look at the entrance into Exodus, uh, into Ephesus. So here we go. I've shown you the broad scope of it. I'll let you look at it from the air and so forth. Now we're sort of going to go in piece by piece. So you'll notice you have these columns all along the way. All Greek cities had columns. If you go to uh, Betion or Scythopolis, the Greek name, you see the columns. Now at one time they were all up and down the way and they had places for, for heating. They had fires to put in. They had sewer systems in these places. They had all sorts of things in these areas of the city. And uh, it's just the way the Greeks did it. So uh, along the way, though, you would have different things. Like, for example, in, example, in a moment, you'll see a small theater that would have maybe held, uh, you know, uh, in the, in maybe uh, a few thousand at max. Maybe, probably that's too much. They were small. And uh, quite different from the major theater in Ephesus, which was one of the largest in the world at the time. But you can see in the background that, that little building right up there, that white one, we're going to get there in just a moment. So as we walk down the walkway, this is what you see. You had different ways to come in. This is one way to come in, and then you had another area over here that came. So you had more than one way to get into this locum where you started moving down the side, down the street. There I am. It looks like my hair is standing up. But uh, there I am uh, at a place called... The, uh, the Pillars of Hercules. And so I stood there, and this must be different trips because I noticed that I have uh, uh, a coat on there and, I, and a different shirt. Because here, uh, there's it, you can look through it, but here I'm holding them up. And if you'll notice, I look different. See? <laughs> so that's another trip. But th these are entering into the major area of the, of the pathway down, down into Ephesus the Pillars of Hercules. <clears throat> so we move on down some more till we get, there's also, there's, there's inscriptions along the way, there are temples along the way, there's that theater along the way, uh, lots of things as you're moving on down into the city. You had a lot of inscriptions that have references to people's names, emperor's names on, on, on marble uh, monuments and so forth. Uh, it's all there to look at. All you have to do is take some time to learn some Greek. <clears throat> By the way, I have difficulty myself, and I've had many, 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 many years of Greek. And it's still hard because, uh, first of all, they're not all as visible as they should be. Secondly, they're all written next to, one next to the other without any word separation. And they're all capital letters. And there's some things you don't know. <laughs> so I, I have to spend a lot of time when I'm looking at it. I can find Greek words. But I don't really spend a lot of time reading these monuments to understand a lot. They they're tend to be abbreviated. Here's a small theater I mentioned uh, along the way. I, I really don't know how many that would see, but that's more like a odium where you have musical performances, small things, instead of massive groups. It's the difference between being in, let's say, a, oh, I don't know, some kind of, a, like maybe going to some kind of event where people are singing in a building to being at the... Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Colosseum for the Cowboys to play or something. You know, it's just it's a difference in, in groups. Uh, this right here, we are moving really right close now. And so we're going to talk about the Library of Kelsen. And let me say, this library is not uh, 
existent in the time of, of Paul. Excuse me, Paul or John either. This was built sometime early second century. It's uh, built after the name of Celsus, who was some kind of official in town. I'd have to explore that more to find out exactly what. But uh, why do I bring it up? Is because you have three major libraries in the ancient world <clears throat> in which you found books. Uh, one was at Pergamum, a great library at Pergamum. This one, this one at Ephesus, and the third one was at Alexandria in Egypt. Remember when the Muslims came into Egypt, at that time it was Christian Egypt, and you had the people uh, who lived there were uh, still today. They, uh, there's a, a contingent of those that are Christians in the city of, uh, of Cairo and other places. And <clears throat> their name actually means Egyptian, the Coptics. That word actually refers to the word Egyptian. And so they uh, <coughs> had a... Uh, uh, they were in place, and then the Muslims came in, in hordes, and the guy in charge of them, when he came to the Alexandrian Library, which housed phenomenal books that we wish that we had hands on. I mean, if you could have them today and say, you know, have saved them, they would have been some wonderful pieces of work, including the entire Greek Old Testament that had been translated there from the Hebrew. That's the first translation of the Bible in the world and it was at Alexandria. They had, a, they had uh, about a hundred different Hebrew scholars who worked on that, put it out. They also had classical works, everything imaginable. We only have two works of some things of Plato, for example, not hundreds. Uh, you know, there's some of these books, there's a few, some there's more. <clears throat> None as much as the Bible, but a lot of other books. So libraries are very important, but he came to them and he says, if it agrees with the Koran, then we don't need it because we have the Koran. And if it doesn't agree with the Koran, it should be burned because it's against it. So you couldn't win on that one. <laughs> Either way, burn it. <laughs> and that's what they did. And they destroyed a tremendous, tremendous work in, uh, in coming into uh, Alexandria in Egypt, which, by the way, was considered the second Athens in the world. During the first century of the Christian era, first century, Alexandria became the new Athens and had a neoclassical renaissance that went on. Now we're getting closer to the library of Kelsus, so we're moving down there and we get closer now and looking at it. And there were scrolls, they say about 12,000 scrolls were here at one time. Now remember, they didn't have books like we have books, <laughs> you know, these were scrolls. And there were about 12,000 that were put into places. I don't know if they had any kind of Dewey Decimal System, but you know they had places to put all of these works, and eventually this was uh, destroyed over time. Um, but this actually leads, as you can see, to the next thing. Let me go back up. See to the right? That entrance is what leads into the road to the commercial Agora and down to the theater and off to the harbor. That's what you're looking at. Now a word about Mary, mother of Jesus. I think it's reasonable. I'm not saying it's provable. But it's reasonable she lived there somewhere. <laughs> and that who she was for Christians would have caused them to want to preserve a place for her and her memory. That is not unreasonable. Tradition holds it to be this place here. It's up in the hill a little bit. As you were, if you were going into toward the Kelson Library and walking down, you're going to go right. If you were moving to the library, you would need to look up to your left, up into the hills, and there is the traditional home of Mary. I believe John did take her there. I assume she did live somewhere. And so they, it's either there or somewhere. Sometimes when I'm on tours with people, I would say, now let me tell you where what happened somewhere here. It's very difficult to say, here. <laughs> you get me? There are no signs left. I was here. Yeah, big sign. Sign Paul. <laughs> you don't have that. I can say, in this particular area, somewhere here, things happen, and I can explain. 
Now, if they built a building, for example, I can show you at Caesarea Maritima by the sea, that's what Maritima means, by the sea, maritime, uh, I can show you at the palace of Herod that was built there in the late uh, first century, because you're going backwards, remember, all the way, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, all the way, in that area before he died, a palace that was taken over by the Romans <laughs> when they started governing in 63 so that they would uh, basically have their nice places to you know, stay by the sea. They really didn't like to spend time in Jerusalem. They would go down to the San Diego over their day and, and enjoy the breeze. They didn't like being up in, in the area of Jerusalem. So that's where Herod, sometimes when he was king, when he was out, then you had Pontius Pilate and others go down there too. We do know where the judgment seat that Paul stood in is. So I, if I were there with you, I could say, here. <laughs> Uh, if you look at some other places, I can say they didn't move this wall. It's here. <laughs> you know. So there are things like that, other things that I used to say, we're walking today where Jesus walked, 30 feet above. <clears throat> but now there's some places on the western wall, the southwestern wall of the Temple Mount, I can say you're actually walking on the same location. Your feet are standing on the same places <laughs> that Jesus himself walked. And that's, that's certain. So we have that kind of situation. <clears throat> with, uh, with Mary's house, I don't know, but it's, this is it. This is what you have inside if you were going there today. <clears throat> Let me say something about the Third Ecumenical Council then. This is not Bible. This is a little church history for you. But this is the Third Council of the Church. And... Um, what you have here is Theodosius II. There was a Theodosius I. There was a Theodosius II. There was a Theodosius III. Like father, like son. They kept passing it on a little bit. And so uh, he is a Christian emperor because what happened in AD 325, Constantine became a believer and he then declared Christianity the, not the required religion, but the official religion of the empire. And that's what took place. Eventually, in that same century, you then had emperors that tried to eradicate paganism altogether uh, by force rather than by evangelism and so forth. So eventually you had a, a so-called Christian empire. And uh, there was a person by the name of Eutychus that had a viewpoint. And that came uh, right after this one. People will move from one angle to the next. Here's a hard one for you. And by the way, I don't know if you ever heard of Norm Geisler. Norma's a good friend of mine. We were discussing this one day, and he gave me a very simple way to explain it to people. Let me explain the doctrine of the Trinity. There's one what, there's three who's. <laughs> the three who's are the one what. <laughs> the one what is God. God is three, three in one. So they're not three gods. There's not, you know, individual. You have one what, three who's. With Jesus, there's one who and two what's. So with God, you have God. One what, three who's with Jesus, two who's, one what. <laughs> I said that wrong. I did that wrong. Uh, you have one who, two what's. Okay, got to get that right. So what you had here at this council was dealing with what is called Nestorianism. And it said that Jesus was one person who had both a divine and human nature. Okay? They affirmed that at this council. Because there was an argument regarding the fact that whether you had two persons, one which is divine and one which is human. And by the way, I challenge you, take some time to read your Bible and try to understand Jesus a little bit. And it is sometimes difficult to know exactly how to deal with that because when he's calming the sea or when he's walking in the water, he is not acting like a normal human. Would you grant that? Right? There's a few other things he does along the way that's not normally human. So when he does heal or when he does walk, who is doing the miracle? Well, I would say it's God. But in what sense? See, it's, it's difficult to argue the point, but they did have an issue on this. And we have it pretty well worked out today that you only have one person who has two natures. And the natures don't co-join. They don't get together together. 
the person works through both natures. The person. You have three persons in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Son works through the human and the divine simultaneously. Okay? He cannot know when he's coming. He can know all things simultaneously. Because in one he knows it is God, the other he knows is man. Does that make sense? I always say the little baby that, that Mary was you know, rocking in her arms, at the time she was doing that and feeding him, he was also controlling the entire universe. You understand? You got that down, right? So that's the problem. And the Storianism was a heresy. Now, two persons, two natures was viewed as a heresy. And they named this issue here with Mary... Theotokos, that Mary was the bearer, the one who gave birth to God. But she also gave what birth to a human being, right? But somehow, since the person stays with both natures, she bore God. And that's why they came up with the word Theotokos. Theos, Tico. Uh, Tikto in Greek is the word to bear, to give birth. So it's Theotokos. Then you have another heresy develops called Eutychianism, which said Jesus has one nature and mixed up God and the human and, and divine together. So you got all these options going on. These councils are dealing with it. But this actually happened at 431, the third council. There I am standing in the front. If you know anything about Byzantine churches, you know that all, all the Byzantine churches have a round thing <laughs> like this. You can tell immediately where you are. Uh, they're all connected that way. And the, 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 basically the, uh, the elements and, the, and the, the altar and so forth would be back into there some. There's the other side. Now, what I'm going to show you here is something that very few people get to see. But, of course, if you, can, if you want to go on a tour with me, I'll show it to you. But um, this is the cave of St. Paul. This is on a hill overlooking Ephesus. You actually look down on the whole site of Ephesus when you do this. We walk up the hill, and inside this are a bunch of frescoes, not just of Paul, but frescoes of lots of things. It's beautifully done inside, uh, the colors and so forth. <clears throat> there I'm standing. And this is the earliest picture that's ever been painted of the Apostle, uh, of the Apostle Paul. Now the question is, who are the rest of the people? <laughs> and so you have Paul here, and if you look up there, you'll see a little pi, alpha, uh, upsilon, and I don't know if you can see all of that there. Let's see, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Is this working? Oh, there it is. See this right here? That's paulos in Greek. Paul. This right here you might not know about unless you want to read a second century work, and you can. I have a friend who actually did a, her dissertation on it. <clears throat> it's called Paul and the Acts of Thecla. This is Paul in his ministry with a woman by the name of Thecla who was working with him. So like Jesus, Mary, Mary Magdalene and others, you know, uh, Thecla. And then you have Thecla's mother right here. <laughs> and that's not all obvious. You can't, you can't read it all. But here we all have a lot of wondering, who is this little person here? Right in this little house. Look at the house. Okay. That's viewed to probably be Mary. Because remember, they were contemporaneous. John lived on many years. Paul was dead. Mary would have died sometime in that area. But this is thought maybe to be Mary uh, at Ephesus. So this is where the painting was done. I just saw this and it interested me. Uh, when you see this right here, you know what this is, right? It's like a menorah of some sort. When well, you see these kind of things, oftentimes that's referring to uh, a Jewish community also being there. What was John? Was he a, a Jew? Yes. Yes. There were other Jews. Let's see, Paul was a Jew. John was a Jew. <laughs> Timothy was half Jew. <laughs> You know, we could go through Jewish communities were the earliest 
evangelistic points. I mean, every time Paul went to a city, first thing he did, where's the synagogue? Because you've got common ground to talk. When he went to Athens, Paul got there and said, where's the synagogue? And they said, what's that? There were no synagogues in Athens, Greece. And so he directly dealt with the philosophers on the you know, Areopagus or the Mars Hill. So I don't know. I, I just found that interesting. Here's something that you'll... Have you ever seen these uh, medical doctors things where they have these little snakes go around a little pole? That comes from the god Escapus. Escapulus. Uh, Ascapul... I, I have to say it from Ascalepicus. Asclepius. That doesn't make any sense. Asclepius. Asclepius. There it is. Asclepius. So you have this god who has a major worship center at a place outside of Pergamum in, uh, in Turkey. And it's big. And they have some fascinating things there. And I can't take time to talk about it with you today. But the fact is Asclepius was very important not only in Greece and Turkey, but due to the coming of Alexander the Great, and later on with the uh, Antiochus who pushed, Judah, uh, who pushed uh, Greek religion and practices upon the Jews, Jews became more and more and more and more Greekized, Hellenized, so that you actually had many Jewish boys, sort of like in our culture, if you're not careful about it, the younger age comes up with certain ideas that the older age didn't have that are maybe bad for them, right? We have some of that in the school systems today. That's another subject. But the fact is the, the younger generation were beginning to become more Greek and losing some of their Jewish faith, a problem. Of course, that was somewhat solved because when Antiochus wanted to offer a, a pig on a Jewish altar, which was not a good thing to do, there was a rebellion at that point with a man by the name of Matthias Hasmonean who had a son called Judas Hasmonean and later got the name Judas Maccabeus, which is not his last name. That means Maccabeus means the hammerer, the one who hammers. And what he did, he hammered and hammered and hammered the Greek army by something that they had not experienced before. It's like uh, some of these groups that go in and just hit and miss Go in and go out, go in and go out. You know what I'm talking about? And they gradually, over time, wiped out the Greek army and all the, all the desire of the Greeks to stay there because they would catch them on overpaths. I, I spent some time reading the Maccabean materials. And, you know, they would catch them as they would come through and they would throw rocks and spears and stuff down on them when they had no ability to move. They had nowhere to go. <laughs> and so they gradually, little by little, they broke the morale of the Greeks and that's because of Matthias and his, his sons. He had several sons, but Judas was the one we think about. And from them came the Hasmonean dynasty, which eventually became the priesthood, because see, Matthias was a priest. It eventually became the priesthood of Israel, all the way to the time of Christ. So these things happened, and they, but they never quite got rid of it. Sometimes when you get something, you don't ever sort of wipe it all out. You get, it's, it's unfortunate it's there. And that's what happened in Israel, which I'll show you. Um, <clears throat> so I, first of all, I'm going to see four ways in which you find uh, the idea of the Asclepian. The first of all is a Jerusalem pool of Bethesda. Some of you said you've been to Israel. I hope you went to the church at, uh, of, um, oh my goodness, I can't even think of the name of it. Um, it's not ringing a bell. But anyway, there's a small church there by the Pool of Bethesda where the white uh, clothed fathers uh, priests uh, work. Very nice people. Beautiful singing inside that building. But you'll see the Pool of Bethesda. Now, it looks odd for you <clears throat> because it's the same problem I dealt with Jesus and the apostles before they did excavations at the Western Wall. Ronnie Reich and people like him, I got to spend time with him. He was the one who did the excavations at the Western Wall. And they dug down, 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 down. Now, if you look up, you'll see the ground level where people are standing at the Western Wall standing up, and yet it's all dug out 30 feet down. Okay? So that's what's happened. If you look at the Pool of Bethesda, 
you wonder because you, you say, where's the pool? It's way down there because it's, you're up here and now it's down there. The, in the days of Jesus, you would have been down there too. You wouldn't be standing up here. You understand me? Civilization over a thousand, couple thousand years builds up all this dirt and, and building structures and so forth. So you're looking down where Jesus would have been standing 30 feet down there. Now, <clears throat> having said that, what you find in the Pool of Bethesda is you have a section of it set aside for the god Asclepius. Now, why do you have that at a place the Jews are? I'm saying the Greekisms hadn't left. Rome was in charge now, and they didn't have them taken out either because they were worshiping the same gods. <laughs> so when you have the man that's lying on a mat in John's Gospel who wants to get into this pool to be healed, he's there at a Greek Asclepian site. And because they, even then you have a Jewish guy who's believing there's some value in doing that, at this pagan site. Do you understand me? It's possible even for Christians today to get mixed up with pagan ideas if we're not careful. Right? So, uh, we're going to look at that. This is the area of the Asclepian. If you can see this, this sign actually says this. <laughs> it's the site of the, of the, of the, uh, the worship center for Asclepius. Uh, here is the actual area. The Pool of Bethesda this was a church. They built a gigantic church here years later in the Crusader times on some columns that are gigantic and providing the structure underneath. And there was a big church here one time. So you're still not where the Jesus was. You've got to go way down here, <laughs> down here, and you see the actual pool. But this was higher, and it was up at this level. Okay? Now, I was careful how I did this. I had to do some structure changing. But this is actually from Corinth, but it helps us to understand it. In the day of, of the New Testament, the god Asclepius, as he was viewed, was the god of healing. That's why you have the medical thing connected to it and the snakes. Okay, they were act, the snakes were viewed as good luck charms. <laughs> they really were. So that, uh, that was, a, that was a, a good thing. And then you had... Uh, if you go to Pergamum, outside of it, away from the mountain, they have a gigantic area where they would actually invite people in to, to go through the healing progress. Now, here's how they did it. See if you like this. You come to the Asclepian. Asclepian is where it is. Asclepius is the god. You come to it, and you say, I'd like to be admitted into your, uh, into your facility. <laughs> okay. Where they had places, they had like jacuzzis, jacuzzis to, to be in the water, and they put various kinds of salts in and they had all sorts of practices to try to help your health okay they said what's your problem and you explained it and they decided by looking you over whether they would accept you in or not if you were in a if you were a bad case they sent you away if you're in a good case they could take advantage of and declare you healed they kept you <laughs> it worked out real well for them so only they only accepted those that aren't too, aren't too sick and into their situation. But if you wanted to worship the god Asclepius, you would go to the temple, and what you would do is take this pottery-like stuff, and you molded it into the form of what you're needing healed. In other words, if your foot is hurting you, you make a, a cast of your foot, and you take that to the temple as a votive offering to the god Asclepius to heal you. He's the god of healing. If your foot hurt, if your arm hurt, if your head hurt, there's one somewhere. The brain there, see the brain? <laughs> if you look up there, you see a head with a little brain. Uh, all sorts of things. I left out some items, but I, that, they're in the original. Okay, now, here's a sample of the snakes. See the snakes? This was something going on at Ephesus. It was going on throughout the world, even in Jerusalem. By the way, you don't have only Jews in Jerusalem. You have others, too. Okay? Here's the Asclepian temple at Ephesus. This god, because he's a god of healing, got a lot of attention. Well, public immorality is also found at Ephesus. I'll not go into that, but there's the, the guide in how to get there. And then you have various uh, monuments of some sort or, or statues. Here's the god Nike. 
Okay? Here's the, here's the god Medusa. By the way, this is at the temple of Hadrian, the emperor in the time of the second destruction of Jerusalem uh, after the time of Jesus, uh, when finally he declared uh, Israel Palestina. This right here is interesting. This is a grave marker for St. Luke, who's believed to have been buried here. And it has a cross, but it also has a bull. And you would say, why a bull? Because if you, if you go back and look in the uh, ancient world when they talked about the apostles, they actually classify them under categories. And you can see that if you go into the Church of Nativity, into the Roman Catholic section toward the front, they actually have each of the apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, with a different animal. And Luke gets the bull. <laughs> this is a god, goddess, Artemis, also called Diana. Uh, Artemis came up forth in two ways. She, uh, she appears here as a many-breasted one, the all-sufficient person. She is a goddess of many cities, not just Ephesus, but many cities. They liked Artemis as their goddess of choice who would take care of the city. That was her job. So it was, didn't always do well, but nonetheless, that was her job. And sometimes, though, Diana is also featured as having a, a deer and a, a quiver and a hunter, huntress. You have two depictions of Diana in the ancient materials. I give you some examples here if you look at these. This says Domitian, this says Diocletian, this says Tiberius. They put various emperors on these, this particular monument. Same thing here. This is a, the only one in Ephesus. This actually says Ephesus in Greek and is on a stone where you actually have the name of the, uh, the city there. This is the Asiarch that I mentioned. Galatia, Cilicia, and the Pontus is here also and some others. This right here is a coin which actually has Ephesus written on it. I'm not going to say much about the emperors. This right here just basically if it talks about Augustus Caesar. I want It's Latin. I can read you the materials, but I'm watching the clock. This is the uh, particular temple of Hadrian. All these gods, all these cities recognize the emperors, obviously. Let me, let me mention a couple things here. I'm going to skip past this. Here's some beautiful things. They have actually now uncovered houses at Ephesus, some of the great murals or something on the ground like, like a mosaic or maybe a fresco, uh, a fresco on, the, on the walls. This is some of the archaeology going on there. Look at some of these places. Really pretty. Now, I'm going to take you right here into the theater. That's where we're going to end. Uh, you would go through here and you walk on down the way and go by the commercial. Notice the Agora here shops that people would shop in. Moving into the theater itself is right here. You can step in there. By the way, a lot of these Greek theaters, when you stand in a place like on the stage or something, when you talk, your voices, you don't need a microphone. It just talks throughout the stadium because of the way the stone works. If you go to a place in uh, Jerish in Jordan, they have these uh, just circles cut in around the wall. They also have a place in the middle. And when you, say, when you talk there, it just reverberates. It's up and down your body. It's, it's crazy like. But you, if you get here and just whisper real loud, like, the person on the other side with their ear can actually hear you clearly. Stone carries this. It's amazing. So here's the theater to give you. I've showed you this before. And this is the harbor. I want to take you down to the bottom here. Walking down that and see where you see this right here. This is going to the harbor, the harbor out here. When you get there, the problem is there is no harbor. Years ago, an earthquake occurred at this area and moved the sea out 10 miles from this location. Isn't that interesting? This used to be a harbor that went out of a major city in the ancient world into the Aegean Sea. The earthquake redesigned the whole thing for them. There is no harbor there if you go. You just walk on the grounds all you work on. So this is the uh, last of the sh video, uh, not of uh, the presentation. But just to give you a feel for Ephesus, I've tried to lead you through it, give you some insight into some of the theology and some of the Bible 
and some of the history and archaeology and so forth to have, you know, so when you read Ephes uh, Ephesians or when you re read it in the Acts and so forth, you sort of get a feel for where these people were and what they did. So I hope that helps. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for all your many blessings and the way you've enabled us to have understanding that you've given us a word that is historically accurate, that speaks to truth, that teaches us about our relationship with you and with each other. And Lord, we just pray that uh, as we study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that do not need to be ashamed, that we can properly understand Scripture, understanding it through many different means. And so we appreciate all the opportunities to do so. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow as we close our service in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the time, opportunity to assemble and to listen to this wonderful presentation by Dr. House about the archaeology of Ephesus. And we thank you so much that it reinforces the things that uh, the absolute truth of your word has uh, been preserved for all eternity. We thank you uh, that uh, Dr. House was able to fill in for Robbie while he was gone. And we just, in uh, closing, we just pray for our Pastor Dean's uh, safe return. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.